detective students and teachers from around Victoria joining us today for our second Ask the Expert webinar for this year, Wild About Waterbugs. I'm Nicole Howie and I love my job because I support schools in the North Central CMA region to learn about catchments and waterways uh, and also support coordinators in other regions to do the same with their schools. And one of my favourite river detectives activities is macroinvertebrate sampling, playing with and identifying water bugs. Um, I love doing it myself and I love doing it with students um, and people of all ages actually, because I can they I can see, I can hear and I can feel how excited they get by water bugs. Um, they get such a joy out of it and it's really lovely to see everyone loves water bugging. Um, and our guest today not only loves it too, but knows a lot about water bugs. So welcome, John. G'day. Nice to have you with us. Nice uh, John Goodrum is a freshwater ecologist. He runs the Water Bug Company and works uh, with the National Water Bug Blitz. Um, co-authored co the Water Bug book and co-created the Water Bug app. Um, you love water bugs, John, we know, and you support citizen science projects to monitor rivers and waterways and wetlands around Australia using water bugs. Um, so thanks for so much for joining us. It's really great to have you with us. Uh, before we go on, I would like to acknowledge that I'm talking with John today on Jar Jawaran country, home of the Jara people, um, whose country uh, are you on, John, in Tasmania, where you're talking to us from today? Well, I'm uh, down just south of Hobart, well, a fair bit south of Hobart, so this area is sort of a uh, Millicuddy um, mob, mainly, around yep. here. Okay, great. Um, and we do acknowledge the enduring connection that, that all traditional owners have with land and water and the skies. Um, and the role that they play in, um, yeah, helping us learn about nature as we move forward together in partnership. So macroinvertebrate sampling is, it's one of um, the three core citizen science activities that our river detectives do, John. So we do uh, water quality testing and schools can choose from these, this suite of, uh, of activities, but water quality testing, water bug sampling and habitat surveys are the three the core ones, uh, but without a doubt, everyone's favourite is water bugs. Um, so you would have experienced the same from four year old kinder kids to year 12s to year eights um, and 80 year olds. Everyone's captivated by water bugs. Um, and I think it's because it's this hidden underwater world and they don't really realise these things that that live there. So um, but if there's one thing I've learned doing water bug sessions, although it does answer lots of questions about what's in there and how they survive. There's also a lot of questions that are generated, more questions than answers, I think, in any session that I ever do. And I'm not an expert at all. I'm self-taught and taught via things I've come to that you've run, which is wonderful. Um, so we asked everybody, all our river detectives, what would you like to know about water bugs? What are those questions that drive you crazy? And students from around the state have sent in some questions to frame our discussion today. Um, so we might start with you, John. Um, I'm sure students are wondering how you came to have such a cool job. How did you um, get into what you do and uh, how, what do you enjoy about it? Well, um, I, I became a freshwater ecologist because I wasn't very good at becoming a vet. So I spent mm -hmm. um, a lot of my university failing things and you know not, not quite managing to get into courses and stuff like that. And then in the end, um, it turns out um, it was kind of nice going this way rather than being a vet because I've mucked about with vets since and I think this is actually more fun. Like, I hate to say that one job is more fun than another, but I think this is more fun than being a vet. Um, so it was nice not getting in. Um, and I guess the sort of things I do, which was the other part of that question, is um, I, uh, as a consultant, I, I assess river ecosystems for whether or not they're um, they're damaged or not. So we're looking for impacts, whether they're, they're mucked up or not. And you can tell that by the type of bugs you get there. Um, and then the other thing I do is teach people like yourselves how you can do that. And that's that's probably the more fun bit because you get both. You get to play with the bugs and you get to play with the enthusiastic human beings like yourselves. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of cool. Um, I guess um, I could pop up a slide about now that would show you, I guess, the sort of thing that, that, that happens there. And um, I guess this is the sort of thing that happens. This is Australia. Um, and what we've got there in that image is um, all the rivers that the National Waterbug Blitz has, has um, mucked about with, but also all the, the government does, different governments in the different states do a lot of um, work on this sort of thing. And this is pretty much as many of the waterbug assessments that have happened in Australia since like the 1990s, all in one spot. 
And you get a really good feel instantly when you look at that for where's kind of knackered and where's okay. So red dots mm-hmm. are sort of places that are impacted and green dots are places that are still in really, really good condition. And, and the thing I like about this graphic is it shows you there's still lots of places um, in Australia where the rivers are in really quite good condition. Yeah, definitely. Lots of green there. That's it. Awesome. Um, and I suppose we know, you know, and I know that water bugs are a great activity for kids. Um, and anyone that does it realises straight away, teachers all around the state, um, you know, look forward to doing this with their their students. But if you had someone saying, why should I bother? Why should we look for water bugs? Why do we need to learn about them? What's so cool about them? What would you say to convince them? What? Why would you say water bugs are the go? Well, look, if they're that stubborn, they're probably not going to be turned around <laughs> anyway. And some people just don't like water bugs. Like my mum never really got into them. She always sort of right. used to nod her head and go, I don't know why you spend your time on those. <laughs> so they're not for everybody. But the reason I get into them and the, the reason I find other people tend to is that they're so amazingly diverse. Like if you if you go and look at stuff under a rock, Yes, there's going to be some, you know, there'll be slaters there, there'll be side hoppers and, and that sort of stuff. But if you go and stick your net in a dam or something, the diversity is just ridiculous. It's really, really, really rather nice. Um, I guess just to give you a feel, I've got another slide here. Mm. Um, this thing here has uh, just, a, just a random selection. There's a flatworm at the top, there's a damselfly in the middle, there's a stonefly in the top right. There's what we call a regal maggot in the bottom right there. Um, and then there's a back swimmer and a mite. And, and there's just... Like, there's no one rule for this group of animals. Wow. They're really, really, really lovely. You've got, they, they don't all share the same number of legs. They've all got, some of them have eight, some of them have six, some of them have none. Um, some of them have legs for some of their life, but not the rest of their lives. They're all, you know, wildly, awesomely diverse in the way they do that. And you can get something like that out of a little tiny habitat like this. This is a farm dam. So it's it's just so awesome that you can get so much out of so little. And um. Yeah. If you throw them all into one place, like a, a like a, a tank or a, a tray, just to have a look at them, it, it can be kind of dizzying. This is um, just after a wetland has, has wetted for the first time. So this is week one of a wetland after the rains first come. And this is, I guess, a lot of your countryside around you guys will be like this because you've just been clobbered Absolutely. by enormous rains. So your wetlands will be like this. And there's just too much stuff going on to look at. Mm-hmm. And I guess that's why. It's the it's the the awesome amount of diversity that there is in these systems yeah absolutely and i think i've already thought of a question that we didn't anticipate on but um and we don't have to answer it now but keep it in the back of your mind if we have time um because of the timing of this webinar and the fact that we have experienced some floods a lot of students might be wondering you know once country is inundated and then this explosion of bugs happens is it have they moved in there with the floodwaters or have they come to life from eggs that were in the ground or uh, flying insects incredibly opportunistic and get in there quickly and lay their eggs and that's where the explosion comes from? Like I just that's wonder a, how That's an will... awesome yeah. question. It's a really good one for me because I can answer it really easily by saying all of these. Right. <laughs> so you're absolutely right. Most of the critters in that, that seething mass that we saw before, they were from eggs. But everything you just said happens and that's why there's such a diversity there. Mm. And then, of course, we get the boom in the frogs and everything else that's yeah feeding on, that's on those bugs. Yeah. So when we're talking, we just had a little um, hint at um, at habitat there and where we're going to find these water bugs. But yeah, how would you explain where water bugs that we're talking about today can be found, and and what some of the the best habitats that will support water bugs are? At a small scale, um, water bugs live anywhere that you can fit. You know that you can fit them. So if you can imagine a river, it's made up a whole bunch of rocks. Um, if you imagine your, your fists are two rocks and you pop them together side by side, no matter which angle you put your two hands together, you'll find that there's always little gaps between them. And that's basically the places that bugs live. If there's sticks and leaves and stuff, there'll be gaps between the sticks and leaves and stuff underwater. They're places for them to live. And so a nice place has a diversity of places for bugs to hide, but it also has nice water quality too. Um, so I guess I mean, here's a picture of a, a, a little stream we have in down in near Hobart where I, I live, um, and you can see the picture on the left there. That's probably not the most awesome stream. I know there's a couple of places like that in Bendigo and Ballarat. I can't see it at the moment, John. We're still looking at the video. Are you now? Yeah. How about now? How about now? Yes. Yep. Ah, cool. Got it. Must be a little bit of a lag in that. Um, so you can see that the concrete line channel on the left there, there's probably about 
three different bugs there. And then in the um, same stream, but much, much, much further up where it's much, much nicer, you'll find that there's um, lots more. So you go from this thing where you have four bugs like that. Has that changed for you? Yes, it has. Yeah. To, um, you know, many, many more bugs. Yeah. And it, it's it's really, 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 really obvious sort of that the, the nicer place with more places to live gives you better bugs. So I guess that's the big pattern with it is nice water quality and lots of places to put them. Yeah, absolutely. And, and a variety of types of habitat, I suppose. You've got some creatures there that prefer the, the, the gravelly bottom, some that prefer a lot of vegetation. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. and with um, all the sampling we do, we try and get a little bit from everywhere. And that's how you get a good sample. It's the sample that has that you've taken from the, the most, the biggest diversity of places, I guess, gives yeah. you the biggest diversity of critters. Awesome. Well, we've got a question from a grade two student at Langley Primary School. Um, and I suppose to uh, describe where Langley is for, because we've got students from around the state, it's probably between Melbourne and um, Bendigo, on, not far from the Compassipi River. Um, and a grade two student there wondered, what is your favourite stream to um, look for water bugs in, John? That's probably a, stream. Like choosing a favourite child but <laughs> no, no that's all right i have a i have a, a loophole i can i can use um i was quite proud of myself when i thought of this um it's it's actually it's it's a, it's a river or a wetland that i haven't been to yet so my favorite one is a new one um i love the fact that a lot of this stuff is like exploring it's sort mm -hmm. of you know like it was middle of last century you get to sort of set off and you see stuff for the first time even if it's not you know you're not the first person necessarily to see this stuff but each new ecosystem you stick your head in um, has new and special and wonderful things. And, and quite regularly, I get, I, you know, I have an idea of what I think's there. I just love being wrong. I love it when you pull the bugs out and there's like twice as many of them there than you thought. Or, or even if there's, you know, there's stuff missing, it's still fascinating and it's interesting. Yeah. Um, I guess the only thing I'd add to that is it's nice to, because I'm in Tasmania, a lot of our rivers are quite cold. And so I, I get um, chillblains and stuff when I'm yeah. sitting around looking at stuff. <laughs> so warmer rivers are nicer, but um, not necessarily always prettier. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a good good way to answer it. And I'm the same. I'm a bird watcher. So, um, yeah, I just love it doesn't matter if I'm seeing some of the same birds, but in a new location, you don't know what you're going to find. So it's that anticipation, isn't it, of yeah. what, what you will find there. Yeah, so in terms of types of bugs, we all love hearing about, I think that's what I love sharing with children is those amazing adaptions that bugs have, the way that they've learnt over centuries, millennia to to thrive and to survive in the water because obviously they are little things that are lunch for everything else, so they've got to be pretty savvy about how they look after themselves. Um, so, yeah, I thought maybe you'd like to share some of the quirky little things that bugs do in their, in, with their bodies to either hunt their prey or protect themselves from being eaten. Yep. Well, I guess the, the, the two examples I, I thought of um, uh, when you mentioned this before was um, one of my favourite beasties that features in the little the, the video that we put on YouTube the other day, the, the Build Me a River thing. Um, I, I'm always amazed by really simple animals that do awesomely complicated things. And I guess the best example of that that I've ever, ever come across is probably um, the simulids um, or the black fly larvae. Um, sometimes these little guys get called um, chicken drumstick animals. Um, how's that video running? Is that okay? Yep, it's a little slow, but it's good. Sl yeah, no, that's good. It's getting better now. That, that works okay? Yeah, yeah, yep. Cool. And so these guys move around by doing this thing where they, they can produce silk, um, like a, sort of like a cross between glue and silk. And they, they, they basically spew it up onto the rock in filaments. And then that sort of goes hard really, really quickly. And then on their bottom end, they've got all these little hooks like Velcro, and they can hook the hooks into the, the silk that they've just stuck down on the ground. And that's how they move around. And so these things are really quite amazing. It's, it's for all intents and purposes, it's a little maggot. There's nothing going on there, really. It's like a little tiny larval body with a tiny little head capsule on the end. And they just do the most amazing things. They move around like that. And then often you get them in huge proportion. Most of the fly larvae do this thing where you, you, are, you never, we well, very rarely just get one. Usually they, they reproduce quite rapidly, a bit like the mozzies that you guys are struggling with at the moment. And um, so you end up with sort of setups like this, where you've got like hundreds and hundreds of them in, on the rocks. And they move around like that little fellow was in the video that you just mm. saw until they find absolutely the best spot for them ever. And then once they're there, They'll defend it by clobbering other simulids over the head. But then once they're in position, they do this awesome thing where I think you can see it in those ones that are on the um, on the, the green strands of uh, aquatic plant yeah. there. 
their um, antennae um, blossom out and they end up looking like moose antlers. So they're this really bizarre organ, organ that's just sort of folded into their heads. And then they use these to collect um, particles of food that wash past in the flow. So it's an amazingly complicated yeah. existence for something that's tiny. Like these things are all of about, you know, two or three mil. Um, mm. And they do all this stuff. In contrast. I had, yeah. Yeah, I had yeah, a sample you know? the other day that was full of them. It was just, yeah, they were on yeah, mass. Yeah. And you, yeah. you, they're so distinctive too. Like they do that lovely leech-like movement, but they're not leeches. So they've got like their head, bottom, head, bottom type movement. Um, in contrast, I guess, some of the bigger, more complicated um, invertebrates that you see um, also do cool things. This is a dragonfly. And um, the cool thing about the dragonflies is their mouth parts. So they have this thing where the mouth parts fold up under their head and they allow them to reach much, 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 much further to grab their prey. And so this 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 beastie here is is set up in a pond, the bottom of a pond somewhere, and is just pulling the back swimmers out of the water column as they go past if they're daft enough to sit still for too long. Um, the awesome thing about the mouth parts on these guys is that they are almost it's almost like having a folded arm attached to the underside of your head. And you can sort of see that there. Um, I'll zoom forward to the other bit of footage. You can sort of see it there. No, nope, not that one. Not that one here just amazing to see such yeah great footage we don't often we yeah, never get this opportunity this is fantastic cool so you can see this one eating and, mm, and yeah. that is the mouth parts holding the the um, back swimmer there um with a couple of little hooks embedded in the body to hold it still and then the yeah. mandibles which are just in front of the eyes there are basically just chewing through the um through the um the back swimmer to finish it off so it's yeah, a so they're thing. not legs that's part of the jaw that's it yeah yeah mm. wow so um, and yeah, they, uh, the, that's a whole bunch of little bits of video of them eating all sorts of other things. But we'll leave it there. One yeah, eating no, animal, that's that's the same as another eating animal. Amazing, yeah! What a great adaption. It's like Go Go Gadget. The students that list, are listening won't remember Inspector Gadget, but maybe they can Google it. Go Go Gadget <laughs> uh, um, mouth. <laughs> go Go Gadget arms. Yep. <laughs> I'm sure there's a, a modern equivalent, but anyway, <laughs> grade three, four students from Kyneton. I'll go to their question first because Kyneton hasn't had a chance yet. They're wondering what are the most dangerous water bugs? Because I know when I introduce water bugs to students, sometimes I have to quantify that. You know, you know, they're not centipedes and redback spiders and bugs that you might be scared of. These are, yep. they're not going to hurt you. They're very, um, yeah, but are they dangerous water bugs? Well, it's funny because we, we, I also go to great lengths to explain that um, no water bugs won't hurt you. Um, and generally speaking, they won't. And the ones that you get in the water when you pop them in a tray and you have a look at them for a water watch activity, none of those are ever going to really hurt you. But... Um, Mosquitoes are responsible for, you know, more than two million deaths annually um, around the globe. So, and they're a water bug when they're in their larval sort of stage. So I'd, I'd probably put them as the worst, most dangerous stuff. And I know you guys have got millions of the blighters bouncing around yeah, your landscape at the sure moment. <laughs> but I guess it's, in their defense, it's not necessarily the mosquito themselves that's doing the killing. It's the the other things you can get, like the viruses and the, um you know, the parasites that the blood um transfers when they you know if they've got dirty mouth parts yes. when they bite you yeah. so um it's it's i guess it's probably mosquitoes but it's not really their fault i guess is what i'm trying to say that's right <laughs> um i will probably still slap them as a general rule when i am um, yeah <laughs> when, I, when i encounter them but a um, question without warning what would be the most dangerous water bug in the water to other bugs what's like the fiercest hunter um well, I or think I could cover that as though I had warning. So there's your mosquitoes, <laughs> um, just so you know what they look like, just in case you've never come across one. Mm. Um, the larvae on the right. And then that's actually a, um, the males don't eat, drink blood. So this is a male with a big fluffy antennae. And that's on a slice of orange, just drinking fruit juice. So they're oh. like nectar and fruit juice sort of eaters. It's the, it's the females oh. that do the blood sucking because they need the protein from the blood meal to make eggs for the mm -hmm. thing but that wasn't what you asked i reckon no, probably okay. the, the the nastiest would be like either the dragonflies which we just saw before but a lot of the true bugs the hemiptera have this thing where their mouth parts are fused to make a dagger and you can sort of see that um i don't know can i can you see the my cursor when i do that with a wiggly yes yeah yeah okay so that that structure in the middle of the head that looks like a great big long thin triangle is actually like mm -hmm. a great big dagger 
And the way these guys work is they'll they'll grab their prey with those legs, which you can see are all very spiky for holding onto things and not letting them go. And then they'll stab them, um, which is, you know, fairly formidable and fairly um, uh, effective when you're going to get prey. Um, it's also, if you're daft enough to hold them um, the wrong way up and flat against your hand, um, you can get a nasty little prick sort of out of them. And I, I did that last week just because um, I'd forgotten that it happens. Yeah. Um, Nothing fatal, just surprising. I think I may have um, like jumped and thrown the poor old water um, back swimmer <laughs> up into the air, and it, so it worked for it. It got away, which is exactly why. In that group, the the hemiptera or the true bugs, there's actually there's the back swimmers, but there's a lot of more um, more menacing looking beasties as well. So this is uh, a uh, a couple of water scorpions, and these you know quite regularly will dispatch fish and tadpoles, so they are quite. Mm. Um, lethal in what they do and the main main reason that they're that lethal is that they get to is they sit still and they don't do anything so they're actually really really boring in a tank yep. because they sit still the whole time the cool thing about them is, i guess I suppose. that's it it's very much camouflage yeah. and um this is two different um genera so these have different names there's uh renatra on the left there that's a it's basically a stick mimic i guess yeah. and then lacotrophes on the right there is a leaf mimic and you can see they're both pretending to not be there by being these mm. different things and the reason that they can sit still and pretend to not be there is they've got these awesome snorkels sticking out of the back ends that often puncture the surface and they so they can breathe air and not move and wait for something like a fish to come past and then they'll grab it with their front legs and then they'll do that stabbing thing like the back swimmer did you can sort of see with the guy on the right there there's a, a little fish just down in front of Oh yes, yes, eyeball. so camouflaged. Yeah. yeah, so that I'd I'd like to be able to say that um you know just after the photo went off that <laughs> that got um killed and eaten, but it didn't. It it bounced off the um the water scorpion's head for about twenty minutes and it did nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that little stinger that the back swimmer and the scorpions have is it um is it just to sort of give the bug enough of a fright to be susceptible to being grabbed, or is there a little bit of poison in there, or? Um, if if you were daft enough to hold on to them after the in, initial puncture wound, um, there is a whole bunch of digestive enzymes. So the way they work is it works like a straw. So they'll stick it into the prey and then they'll um, vomit up some digestive enzymes, a bit like a spider does with its prey. Yep. And then everything turns to soup inside and then they suck all of the soup out. So there's Love that it. sort of a thing going on as well. <laughs> Very lovely. Awesome. Ah, they're so clever. And the idea of just sticking your bottom out and breathing air is pretty cool. <laughs> um, we digress. So back to our questions. Um, grade two students at Langley Primary School. This is like choosing your favourite child, but favourite bug for you. What would be, and I know it will probably vary, but you've got a favourite one to tell us about today and why it's your favourite. I do. Um, it sort of comes from... There's some bugs you don't see very often, and um, they have a end up with a sort of a mythology around them. And um, whenever we, uh, whenever I'm in the field, and um, we find a, a, a what's called a, a, they're one of those things that the, the the adults called a net winged midge, and you see them sometimes. They're sort of gangly looking things with long legs, but the larvae are the coolest thing in the world. Um, here's a picture of what we call a bleph. And we have this thing where, as freshwater ecologists, if you find a bleph when you're in the field, you get to make a wish because they're a bit scarce. They're kind of rare. And it's sort of like, um, yeah, it's just one of those special, special moments. And blefs, other than, you know, allowing you to make a wish, also have this really cool thing where they're just nuts as an animal. They look like a whole bunch of gummy bears stuck together, mm. for starters, which is, you know, <laughs> not your standard body form. And then just to make that even weirder, um, their underside is, um, you can see that on the right there, is a series of suction cups. So these guys don't have legs, they have suction cups. And the way they use those is they'll be sitting on a rock like the guy on the left there, and they'll be in a really fast part of the water. So the water will be hammering over their heads. And the cool thing about that is that there's not many predators that will put up with that. So you're not gonna get your head bitten off while you're eating the gray green goo that lives on the rock. So it does this thing where they've got a place where they can relax, um, you know, what if, I don't know whether it's very relaxing having 60 kilometer an hour water beating <laughs> against your head every second of every day, yeah. but at least you don't have to worry about having your head bitten off. So that's, that's what they do. And, and that's how they do it with this amazing set of suction cups. And then to move, that's really hard. They've got to actually undo the suction cups at the front and then wiggle and then put them down again. So they're quite funny to watch. They do this very sideways movement, go unstick, stick, unstick, in, stick. Yeah. In that velocity of water. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. they're, they're 
awesome beasties. They're, and I, I reckon they'd be my favourite. Um, they are yeah. cool. Really odd shape. Totally. Thanks. That's, yeah, don't often get to see those ones. So that's a bit special. Fantastic. So um, we've al already alluded to the fact that some of our bugs don't live in the water their whole life. They start their life cycle in the water and, um, and morph. But as uh, baby bugs, we often call them nymphs or larvae. And a few children often ask me, what is there a difference in that term nymph and larvae? Or is it just a different word for the same thing? Um, there is a bit of difference. Um, I'll show you another picture. So this is a picture of the difference, I guess, between a nymph and a larva. So both nymphs and larval types are ways of growing as an insect. Um, and I guess the simplest way is, is, is um, probably, oh, that's not true. Probably the, the one that involves less upheaval is the nymphal larva life cycle. You end up, you start out with something like, this is a, a water boatman. You can see up the top right here. Yep. And once it's hatched out of its egg, it basically looks like its parents. They're sort of, you know, it's got two eyes on the front, sort of a boat shaped body and two big legs. And you can see mum down the bottom there, looks very much the same. The only difference between mum and the baby is that mum has a fully formed set of wings. And what will happen is uh, as insects grow, they do this really um, cool thing where they split down the back and they have a new a, set, a new skin inside the old skin. And so they get rid of the old skin and the new skin is soft but it's actually a little bit bigger than the old skin. And so they then pump it up and then they fill it full of them and their food and they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And in between being an egg and an adult, there might be anything up to, you know, 10, 15 skins in between one end and the other. In contrast, so that's a nymph, a nymph does that. In yep. contrast, the larval life cycle, you do this thing where you, these, these animals have all made the decision that they want to grow really fast, usually. And so what they do is they have a really simple body. It's basically a head with some bits of cutlery for eating, mandibles or, you know, something. And then this sort of uh, elastic-sided garbage bag of a body. Like, and, and, and what they'll do is they'll eat as much as they can. Yes, they'll still shed their skin, but because it's such a simple body, there's nothing to it. They just go shed, bonk, back into the eating and then there comes a time where they want to be the adult. And I guess the big thing with all of these insects that we're talking about here is they all fly when they're adults. They all have mm. fully formed wings and some of them will leave the water. Well, they'll all leave the water. Some of them will come back again, like the water bugs, the water boatmen come back into the water, but they do leave briefly and they can fly away if they need to. Um, this coronamid, the guy on the left here, the, or a blood worm, uh, starts off as a little red wriggly thing. And then it has to, to turn into a flying machine. The body form is so wildly different that it has to change absolutely everything. Mm -hmm. So they go through this thing called a pupil phase, which is just like uh, you, you will all have come across the very hungry, hungry caterpillar. Yep. Um, it did exactly the same thing. It was a larvae that turned into an adult. And they come out the other side of that pupil phase as these amazing magical flying machines with like all these legs and antennae and really complicated bits that you'd never have dreamed of if you'd seen the, the baby. So yeah. the difference is a larvae, the adult and the baby look nothing alike. Nothing like it. Whereas the nymph, they sort of just look like your gaffer tape wings on afterwards. Yes, yeah, essentially the same, but just a little bit of difference. Yeah, that's there it. There you go. You taught me that and it makes complete sense. It's a really clear way of explaining it. But yeah, I didn't realize that myself but we do marvel all the time that you know kids look at the dragonfly nymph and 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 say or larvae and say oh my goodness that's i know what dragonflies are but that doesn't look anything like it so that's yeah, I suppose yeah. the next question about um yeah how they do that how they turn from that um larvae uh, whether it's a damselfly or a caddisfly or a mayfly into their flying form into the flying form it's a, well, it's a complete transformation isn't it yeah, it, it is. And it, it's the same for many of the insects. This is um, a stonefly, which is a, one, a thing we get out of rivers. And you can see in this particular tray, I've got the littlest one up the far left. And then as they get bigger and bigger and bigger, you can see that uh, on their back, there's a couple of little triangles. I'll try yeah. and get the mouse over the top there. Can you see that there? Yes. Yep. And in the middle one that's sort of yellow, you can see there's just the beginnings of a little triangle. And then the next one along, it's almost like it's got wings, but they're just not very good wings. Um, and what they are is they're wing buds. And inside those are the, you know, the, the eventual wings that will get used by the adult, which is the fellow in the top right there. And you can see body plan, like we were talking about before, almost identical, just with wings stuck on afterwards. And the way that happens is like this. This is a stonefly, and normally it lives underwater. And what it's done in this slide is it's put, pulled itself out of the river onto the side of the rock. And then it starts to dry out a little bit. 
then the next thing it does is it splits down the back and starts to shed that skin and you can just see in this slide it's thorax and head so the head and the first bit of the body pushing yeah. out of the old skin and then it'll do that until a whole new adult is outside the skin and you can see the skin on the left there which is the same shape as it was when it was underwater and then you've got the new skin which has wings attached to it on the right there and so what will happen next is that those wings are the wrong shape for flying so it'll crawl away to a slightly different position and hang itself so that the wings drop down um, and once they do that they start to pump all the blood in their body into the wings down the veins in the wings and that forces the wings into the shape that they need to be so that they can fly. And that's what happens in the next and last step. So you can sort of see that there. Yeah. So that's that's kind of, um, yeah, how the the nymph to adult thing happens. That's amazing. I'm going to sound so knowledgeable the next time I go out to school so we have to <laughs> transfer this. But, yeah, this is great. There's so many students that are going to be just, yeah, having so many questions answered here. We, yeah, that's cool. amazing footage. Thank you so much. Um, so a lot of our, our little caddis flies, and they are um, larvae, the one that, that um, a lot of people love to find, you know, the walking sticks. Um, yep. And it's amazing for students to realise that that thing that's moving has something living inside it. Do they all change into caddis flies or do some of the all caddis fly larvae do the transformation process and turn into flying caddis flies or? Um, they do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So every, every, every caddis fly will, will emerge eventually. And, um, I guess I've got I've got a, a sort of an equivalent for them because they go through the pupil phase. They do this weird thing where they they sort of uh, pupate underneath a rock in a river or on the on the side of the mud bank, and then they have this really cool thing where that pupa most mostly pupa just sit still and don't do anything because all the busy work is happening on the inside and they're like yeah. creating magnificent flying machines sort of under the cover of darkness inside mm -hmm. the pupa. Um, but caddisflies have to do this thing where the pupa's underwater. So they need this stage where that pupa needs to be able to get itself out of the water because otherwise it would emerge as a flying insect and then just drown instantly. Yes. Yeah. So they have this thing where the pupa can walk up the side of a rock like this, and then it'll go through that last section, um, last um, set of changes just on the side of the rock like this. And so this is one of the caddisflies that you were talking about. Yep. Um, and you can see it does the same sort of thing, splits down the pupil back and then pops out. And you can see um, it's really, really, really struggling. And the, and the reason it's really, really struggling like this is because it's not only um, shedding its skin, it's also shedding all of the insides of its throat and all of the insides of its trachea, which is the system that it breathes through. And you can see those white um, tendrils. They're mm -hmm. probably the insides of its lungs and everything. So they turn themselves totally inside out. And then this guy's doing that bit that we were talking about before, where they hang the wings, pump them full of blood, and then it's pretty much all but ready to go. And so that's, yeah, all your caddisflies do this to a certain oh. extent. Um, and how long do they stay as larvae? Or does that depend on climate like conditions? Um, and... it, most things that live, because there's a certain amount of seasonality, you know, it's, it's nice mm -hmm. and warm in summer. And if you're an insect and you're bouncing around and reproducing and laying in eggs, it's nice to be out of the water during that, rather than if you emerged in the middle of winter, you get rained on, it'd be cold. Insects need warmth to be able to move around a little bit. Um, and so if you came out in the middle of winter, you just spend your whole time being a bit sulky and grumpy. And so what they tend to do is they spend most of their larval life underwater and then they'll emerge like these. These are a couple of different caddisflies here, but they'll spend um, a year roughly underwater like this, growing up from being an egg to being an adult. This is a net spinning caddis and you can see it's got the, the guy at the top there is the, the net spinning caddis and it's the net that it spins just down the bottom there. Oh, wow. And then in the bottom left, there's the, the moth like thing that they turn into. But all the caddis, you know, regardless of what they do, they'll all spend that at least a year. Some of them actually will, some of the stoneflies, which just um, live up in the colder places, like in the, up in the snow on the mountains, yep. will go for a couple of years. But most things rattle through in a year. And it's just time to, you know, build awesome cases like this, mm -hmm. or build awesome cases Big like this. Um, and, and, you know, they get all that stuff out of the way, and then they'll all emerge and turn into things that look for all the world like moths. But if you're, mm -hmm. if you want to be a clever clogs, um, when you're looking at moths around a light at night, you can tell the caddis flies from the moths because the caddis flies have stupid long antennae and then their mouth parts that are, you know, that in the head, they're also long as well. I'll just whiz back and we can have a quick look at that. So um, there you go. You can sort of see that really, really, really long antennae. And then instead of little yeah. subtle mouth parts, they've got what looks like a couple of arms gaffer taped to yeah. their head. So yeah. it's a much, much longer thing. 
and these guys possibly both of them i think are um are very similar to the ones you get from stick caddis or um headbanger caddis in you know that you get out yeah. of dams and wetlands and stuff and that net spinning caddis i hadn't heard of those ones before is the net to catch their prey it is, is that, they're, yeah they're um they're very cool and these guys will they have to set up in flow a little bit like the the black fly larvae or the simulids mm. that we were talking about before um and you know the flow in that case will go from the right of the screen to the left of the screen and yeah. it's if you look at it under a microscope it's amazing it's it's more precise than fly screen it's it's ridiculously well made yeah. and, um, and they're making yeah. it underwater with flowing that's, water and that's it and it's it's a beautiful <laughs> structure too it's it's all the caddisflies can produce silk and that's what they stick their cases together from yeah um and i guess this is just an extension of that they've made the the silk into this this net as opposed to um you know doing what these guys have done where they've used the silk to stick stones together or yes. used the silk to stick little bits of stick together so that's that's the the different things Amazing. that they do there. So that uh, I've often wondered the log cabin caddis there is it four individual pieces of um, stick that they've stuck together or do they sort of break them and bend them? No, they they or, slice them. I suppose off, you don't they? know unless you ask them. But <laughs> well, no, no. I've, I've so this this particular photo um, I had it in a tank um, in in my office and I, I watched it meticulously yeah. pulling apart. Uh, you know, Muriophyllum, the the water milfoil. Yes. So it, it's got little spoings i guess so it looks a bit like um the tinsel you get on a christmas tree mm. and this thing was methodically chopping sections that were all perfectly the right length mm. and then gluing the corners together sort of all separate. yeah yeah wow so it's, i it's have a, found one of those before it was incredible yeah um it was a bit of a highlight for me <laughs> Lovely. Nice um identifying bugs can be tricky and when you're learning it's yeah and I often say to teachers you know don't even worry about identifying for a while just explore and enjoy and, and then the the need to identify will just naturally come for children mm. when they start asking what is it why does it do that and the inquiry will come but um if students are having trouble identifying a bug what would you suggest well there's, there's sort of two pathways uh, depending on how much internet access you're allowed, um, you can take a photo and send it to we have a thing called Waterbug Face on Facebook, which everybody can yeah send stuff to, and we uh, answer questions on that. Um, alternately, if you if you're using the Waterbug app, um, if you submit a sample, um, uh, if you don't know what it is, you can select what's called unknown bug, and that'll come to me on the database, and I'll you know type the name in for you and send it back. So you can do it through the app or through Facebook, either of those will work. Um, yeah, yep. that's, so it's there as a resource. Fantastic, no, that's brilliant. Um, and in their River Detectives um, journey, students learn that water bugs can tell us about the waterway, um, yep. but obviously they can't talk. And that's one the, <laughs> the question that um, one of the grade two students uh, at Langley asked, how can they, do they actually talk to us? And what do they tell us? And how do they tell us? about the health of a waterway <laughs> so mostly bugs tell us about the health of a waterway by actually being there um or not so if they're dead and they've disappeared it's probably because things were horrible it's that simple um but it's actually a more fun question if you take it like the way it was intended like can they actually talk and generally speaking no but there are a whole bunch of um instances where water bugs communicate not with us necessarily but with each other that are really cool so um and all the examples I can think of are bugs of different sorts. Um, probably the, the most well-known one is um, uh, the, the the mating calls of some of the little water boatmen are extremely loud. And they have this thing a bit like, um you know, the old hair combs you used to get that have all the little teeth. Their front leg is sort of like that. And it's got all these little teeth sort of on it. And then their face has a thing that sticks out sort of not unlike a nose. And then by running the comb across the that and then having a gap behind it, they make what's called a strigitillary noise. Yep. And um, it can be hugely loud. Um, and, and so that they can communicate with that. Um, the other one that's also a bug that's kind of cool is, is not noise, but um, vibrationary ripples. So bellistomatids do this thing where you'll have a male and a female and they'll say your water surface is like this. They'll bob up to the surface and then they'll sit sort of opposite one another and they'll send like Morse code signals to one another with ripples in the surface of the water. Which is what awesome. Bug is that common name? Uh, giant fish killer bug. Right. <laughs> um, wow. my, my friend Edward had them in a tank, and he he said it was quite cool watching them send little ripple codes. They're probably yeah. saying all sorts of rude things about him behind his back. <laughs> Who would know? But, um, you'd never know. 
that's it. <laughs> so times like these, when we've had a massive amount of water coming through our landscape, it's good for bugs in some ways because you're getting wetlands, you know, wetted that won't have had water before and there's a whole heap of explosion yeah, yeah. of life. But for our bugs in our rivers where students are, are monitoring regularly, they've seen more water come through there um, and than they've ever seen before. So what happens to all those water bugs in a flood? Do they all get flushed away and end up congregating at the end of a of a waterway or do they yep. um, hang on? <laughs> well, it's, it, it sort of depends what sort of river you're in. Um, up around <laughs> your way, um, most of the rivers are sort of, you know, that shape and cross section yes. and they're often mud lined. And so the bugs don't have many places to go. And so what will happen is as the water level goes up, they'll run for it and the, off to the sides and try and get out of the flow as much as they can. Yep. If you're in a gravel bed stream where there's lots of rocks and stuff, there's this really cool thing with gravel streams is where, where you look at it and you go, look, that's the river. It's quite obviously, you know, that shape. It's not. Like wherever the gravel is and there's water, it's still the river. And so what will happen in a, a cobble or a, a gravel river is the bugs will burrow into the gravel and they'll keep going down until – they are not being hit by the rocks. Lots of mm. bugs do die in floods. So there's nothing yeah. quite like having large rocks dropped on your head to kill you. No. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, you get lots of crayfish and stuff that have their heads bashed in. And it, it's a it's a it's a it's a interesting time because if you survive it, it's the most awesome thing ever because all of this mm. all of this organics and and resources and stuff get washed in from the banks. Okay. And, um, you know, if you get out there into the floodplain and you get to hang out in a billabong, it might be the best place ever because there's, you know, possibly no predators there for the first week and all the food's just there for the asking. So if you survive, it's awesome. But not everybody survives, I guess. And I've only just thought of this now, but there's a lot of talk around our region at the moment about the dissolved oxygen problem and the um, mm. likelihood that we might have some significant yeah. fish kills. So does that impact water bugs as well? It can. It has to be fairly... so. Often oxygen requirements are linked to body size. So if you're a little tacker, you can get enough oxygen out of the water around you, even if yeah. it's pretty low. But if you're an enormous fish and you've got this complicated gill structure to get every last bit of oxygen out of the water that you need, the instant that oxygen drops, you you, you die quite readily. Um, and yes. so what happens is a lot of the um, leaf matter and all of the, the rotting and decomposing stuff that, that is awesome if you want to eat it as a bug, swamps into the bottom of these bits of river and then starts to decompose and the bacteria and the mainly the bacteria I think is what's working on it to actually dissolve things to actually do their job and break litter down they take the oxygen and if they take all of the oxygen that's where you end up with those things like those blackwater events and stuff yeah. that you guys are talking about and your, your fish will cark it shrimp often have quite high oxygen requirements too so you often get dead shrimp okay. as well um, anything that moves fast or is large um, generally will be susceptible to yeah. dying from a lack of oxygen. Oh, good to know. And what can students do to help water bugs? So in a part of River Detectives is obviously, you know, learning to care for nature, respect nature, help when you can um, and advocate for waterways. So anything that you'd just point out is the biggest thing students can do to help water bugs. Yeah. Um, if you live in an urban area, um, a lot of people don't realise that stormwater ends up basically in the local river. And so not putting things into stormwater could be a hugely awesome thing to do. So people, you know, not tipping leftover paint or oil or, you know, anything in the stormwater that isn't just water um, is awesome because the water quality um, in urban rivers is is just hideous in most of Australia. Um, and so not contributing to that is, is a really relatively simple thing to do. Um, if you live in a place where you've got bits of river or wetland around you, um, planting um, vegetation and trees around it make things much better for, you know, those insects that we were talking about that come mm. out and do holidays on land. Those holidays on land are much more interesting if they've got places to go like trees and bushes and shrubs and, you know, grasses and stuff to hang out in. They're a bit boring if they come out and it's just, oh, a cow paddock or, oh, look, it's a concrete um, playing field. Um, those sorts of things are, are, are kind of important for the the adult stages that get out on the land it's nice to have them in in better condition i guess if you can mm. so plant a tree is always good excellent always good for many many reasons yeah and if students would like to grow up and be someone like you doing freshwater ecology as a job and be paid to do these amazing things what sort of because we do have a lot of secondary students obviously doing yeah, yeah. Detectives as well like what sort of study path did did you do or would you recommend Yep. Um, I, 
I don't think I did it quite right. Like I think to actually get there the better way, you'd have to so you concentrate on your science and maths type stuff and you'll get there in a in a hurry. I did a lot of um uh comparative literary criticism and art subjects. And that slows you down a lot. Um <laughs> but it's sort of fun. Um and and I guess uh but but yes, science and maths, I guess, was was the way to get into biology when I was a kid. And I think it's still very, very similar. Um yeah. So if you've got those, you're in a good place to go and do a, a, a biology based thing. And that means you can do animals, plants, any of those things. Um, and then once you aim for like a, a science course and do as much botany and zoology as you can, if you're interested in it, that's it's a, it's a great way to learn about the natural natural world, I guess. It starts making much more sense at uni. Yeah, and I suppose we've got that pathway as River Detectives too, you know, Water Watch being the adult equivalent of River Detectives. Um, yeah, yeah. Once students finish at a school that has nominated to be River Detective School, you know, when they're old enough or convince their mum and dad to become water watchers, then they could be doing this voluntarily in their own time, yeah, for as long as they like, couldn't they? That's it. And, um, yeah. you know, the, the, the cool thing about that is if you've spent your childhood as a River Detective, you're probably actually really well um, trained to, yeah. to do this stuff for us. So you can yeah. come and do National Water Bug Blitz sampling um, as well, and that'll get us much more knowledge about our rivers. Um, so go and do that afterwards. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> well, that has been amazing. I'm sure everyone that's listened has learned a lot. I have learned a lot. Um, and we do thank our students who put their thinking caps on and um, sent in their questions. It's been great. Um, thanks to everyone who's tuned in and watched. And um, we hope that you are inspired to go off and go water bugging. Um, I suppose the only one question was, is there a better time of year or is it oh, always yeah. interesting to do it? and to compare different seasons um, and see what the difference is, or is there just a better time and don't bother any other time? Generally speaking, so, so any time's good, but if you want it to be easier, it's easier when the animals are bigger. So if you can imagine everything gets laid as eggs sort of towards the end of summer, spring, winter's useless. For starters, it'll rain on you, you'll be cold, you'll be grumpy, but also all the animals will be little tiny things and you, you, it'll be much, much harder to identify them. Spring, summer autumn it's it's much much the, all the animals are much larger um and spring's often the best because the weather's changing and the bugs are starting to think about being big enough to come out of the river yeah. so that's the, the best time to identify animals is when they're the largest they will be so go for spring spring very good well now's the time then so hopefully that's it. people will yeah either be watching this now and get inspired to do it straight away or this will be on our river detectives website for on-demand viewing Cool. whenever schools would like to watch it. So, yeah, thank you very much, John. Yeah, really appreciate your time and your knowledge and your passion and sharing all of that with us today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me, Nicole. No problem. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Cheers. <laughs>